Many years ago, the well-known radio Bible teacher, still on the radio today, J. Vernon McGee, was the guest speaker at a conference we were having here at Lakeside. The conference was several days, so one night before the service, he and I had a discussion in my office concerning the Old Testament. In the midst of our conversation, Dr. McGee said to me, he asked me, he said, can you think of any Old Testament character who was a good father? Well, I thought about it for a few moments, and I answered him and said, I, I can't think of anyone in the Old Testament who stands out as a good father, as an exemplary father. And you know what? It's now years later. This happened many years ago. And uh, I still can't think of anyone. I can't. There just doesn't appear to be any man in the Old Testament who was a model dad. Now, in all fairness, the Bible doesn't always give us a great deal of information about the parenting skills of its characters. However, where it does address the relationship between a father and his children, it reveals some serious flaws of fathers. For example, Isaac. Isaac a believer, but he showed favoritism to Esau over Jacob. No question about that. And likewise, Jacob picked up the same sin, and he showed favoritism to Joseph over his other sons. There was also Eli, the high priest, during the time of the judges, who was a terrible father, terrible, failing to discipline his two sons, who ended up disgracing him and disgracing Israel. Saul, King Saul was a cruel and a jealous-driven father to his son, Jonathan. Not to mention what a horrible father-in-law he was to David. He wanted to kill his own son-in-law, David, and tried many times. And speaking of David, though David was a great man of God, he failed miserably as a father. He was not a good father. He set a horrible example to his children by his adultery with Bathsheba, as well as failing to discipline any of his sons for their ungodly behavior. Now, I'm sure that there were many godly men who lived during Old Testament times who were exemplary fathers, but they're just not mentioned in Scripture. Obviously, there had to be great fathers, but I can't think of any man who is specifically presented to us in Scripture as a role model of a good father. However, that doesn't mean that God is silent on the subject of the biblical role of a father because God has given Christian fathers some very specific instruction on how they are to raise their children. He has given them this instruction in one particular verse in the New Testament, which is the focus of our study tonight, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to fathers he said, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, as you recall, this statement, which is addressed to fathers, immediately follows previous instructions. Paul has given various members of the family. He's already told wives that they are to submit to their husbands. Then he went on to tell husbands that they are to love their wives. And having made it very clear after that to children that they are to obey their parents because they are under their authority, Paul now turns to Christian fathers and tells them how they are to use their God-given authority in dealing with their children. And as I've pointed out to you many times, all of Paul's teaching on the various responsibilities of each member of the family must be understood in light of his command in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by alcohol. Be controlled by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God controls us by his word, the Bible. So only when wives, husbands, children, and now fathers are under the Spirit's control will they be obedient to carry out their God-given responsibility? In other words, only as they submit themselves to the Lord will they submit themselves to each other by serving one another. 
So, a wife will only submit to her husband when her heart is in submission to Jesus. A husband will only love his wife when his heart is in submission to Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. A child will only obey his parents when his or her heart is in submission to Jesus. It's just as simple as that. And tonight, we're going to see that only when a father's heart is in submission to Christ will he serve his children by treating them the way and training them the way the Lord tells him to. Now, the whole issue of parenting, folks, is summed up in the concept, though Paul doesn't mention this word here, this is the concept he's, he's dealing with, the concept of authority. Authority. As Paul has made it very clear in the previous verses, a child is under his parents' authority. A child is to obey his parents because he's under their authority. But unless parents are filled with the Spirit of God, they're going to abuse their authority. And the whole point that Paul makes in this one verse, which is addressed to fathers, is that a father is to use his authority over his children properly. Now, before we go any further, I want to address the question that is probably on many minds here, and it's this. Why does Paul address this verse to fathers and not to fathers and mothers? Were you thinking about that? Well, some do. Anyway, after all, we might reason, well, well mothers are, are certainly in authority over their children too, aren't they? And the answer is yes, of course they are. Yes, they are. This is why in the previous verses, Paul told children to obey their parents. He didn't just say obey your dad or obey your mom. And then he also reminded them of, the ten, of the, one of the Ten Commandments. Children are to honor their parents. He didn't say just honor your father, honor your mother, but honor both father and mother. So it is certainly true that mothers have authority over their children. However, the fact of the matter is that Paul specifically here singles out fathers when it comes to authority over children. Why? For the simple reason that biblically, according to Scripture, a father is the head of his household. And therefore, he has been given by God the ultimate responsibility for the raising and supervision of his children. But certainly, and this is important we understand this, certainly what Paul says to fathers in dealing with children includes mothers because they're also in authority over their children. Nonetheless, Paul does direct his words to fathers because in biblical thinking, and I might add in Roman and Greek culture, the Roman and Greek culture of that day, as well as biblical thinking, a father was the dominant individual in the family, and therefore he would be the most likely of the two parents to provoke his children to anger by the abuse of his power and his authority, which in fact many, many fathers did. But having said this about God giving fathers the primary authority in the home over children, we should listen carefully to these words by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, the injunction is not to be confined to fathers. It includes mothers also. And at a time like the present, we have reached a position in which the order almost has to be reversed. We're living in a kind of matriarchal society where fathers, alas, and husbands have so abdicated their position in the home that almost everything is better left to the mothers. We have to realize that what is said here to fathers applies equally to mothers. It applies to the one who is in the position of having to exercise discipline. So, I draw from that, this, these thoughts. If you're a dad, then understand that you have been put in charge of your children. And you dare not relinquish all of your authority to your wife to do what you should be doing so that you do relatively nothing. And she does everything when it comes to making decisions concerning the children. And if you are a mother, then you dare not usurp all of your husband's authority over your children by excluding him from all of the decision-making that's involved with the children. But having said all this, Paul's commands, then, we need to understand this, they're for both parents, with fathers having the ultimate authority to make sure that these commands are carried out. So, as we go back now to Ephesians chapter 6, we see that Paul devotes just one verse, one sentence to parents in dealing with their children. 
But in this one verse, he has packed a great deal of information, important information, that if you heed and apply this information, it'll be incredibly beneficial to your children and to you. It will be life-changing for your children. So take heed. Now, in addressing parents, while Paul doesn't mention the word, as I said, doesn't mention the word authority, we should understand that this is his subject matter, authority, parental authority. And therefore, his teaching then is divided in this one verse into two basic parts about parental authority. One part is, is negative, what fathers and mothers are to refrain from, what they are not to do. And then the second part is positive, what fathers and mothers are to do. Now, tonight, we're going to look at the first part of Paul's teaching about parental authority, the negative part, which is simply this, the apostles' command. Do not provoke your children to anger. Now, Paul begins by telling fathers, and of course, we've said mothers are included, that they are not to provoke their children to anger. So what does he mean by this? <clears throat> well, the thought is that parents are to refrain from frustrating their children from exasperating their children so that they don't develop a deep-seated and sustained attitude of anger. Now, I feel like I need to clarify something. It's critical that we understand this and critical that we not uh, take this and misunderstand what Paul is talking about a child's anger because if you do misunderstand this, it will have a profound, profoundly negative effect upon your child. So listen closely. Paul certainly does not mean that a father is to refrain from doing anything in life that may cause his child to become angry and upset. Because if that, if that were the case, then a father would be held hostage by his child's sinfulness. They often get angry. They get angry when you tell them to do something they don't want to do. That can't be what Paul means. In other words, because of their rebellious nature, children can very easily become annoyed at being told to do something that their parents have said, do this, simply because they don't like what they're being told and they want to get their own way. And when they can't get their own way, they get upset and they pout and they scowl and they're angry. And this is nothing but sinful rebellion to authority and being angry and being upset. That's the outward evidence of this rebellion. Listen, that's not what Paul is talking about. He is not commanding parents to avoid all conflicts with their children by making sure that they never, these, these little darlings, never get irritated, never get upset. He's not advocating ap appeasing them by just giving in to their sinful fleshly desires. And you know what? I say that because there are many parents who do that. We see them out in public all the time. You want to spank their kid for them, but you don't. You know what I'm talking about. There are parents who do this because they want to avoid all conflicts with their children at any cost. So they give in to whatever the whims of their child are because they don't want them to be upset and angry. Folks, that's not what Paul is talking about. So what is he teaching when he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger? Well, we have something that helps us to understand what Paul meant by this to, to help us interpret his words because there's a parallel verse in Colossians 3, Colossians 3.21, in which Paul wrote to the Colossians and addressed fathers, and he dealt with the same subject. So it's a parallel verse. It complements and helps us to interpret this verse. Here's what Paul said in Colossians 3.21. He said, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. This is an important verse to understand. The expression to lose heart means to take the wind out of their sails. It means to take the, the heart out of them. It means that they become spiritless. The thought here is that of a child being listless, moody, sullen. He's just lost heart. He's defeated. He's given up. He, he feels whipped so that his attitude becomes, what's the use? Why bother? My parents don't understand. Listen, this is a totally defeated and disheartened and discouraged individual. He's beaten down. He's giving up. He's whipped. Now, combined with what Paul says about children being angry 
in Ephesians, you put this together, we see that the apostle's point is that parents are never to use their authority to frustrate and exasperate their child so that their child ends up being characterized by not simply gets annoyed, but a perpetual state of anger that's always simmering and seething. It's just ready to explode, and sometimes it does explode. While at the same time that he's angry and simmering, he feels defeated, feels crushed so that he resents his parents. He's bitter and he's hostile towards them. Now, this is what Paul is saying, that a parent is not to do anything that would lead to his child becoming a defeated, angry, disheartened person. That's what Paul says. But what he doesn't say is what kind of parental behavior might provoke a child to lose heart and become angry. Paul just gives us the principle here. He gives us the concept. <clears throat> he does not go into specifics. Therefore, because Paul doesn't give us any specifics, doesn't give us any concrete examples of abusing parental authority, then it's obviously left up to us to use our own sanctified, common sense to think of ways, <clears throat> excuse me, in which a parent might provoke his child to anger. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go and I'm going to name and explain some of the ways that we can provoke children to anger. And as we go through this list, what you have to do is to be open to the Lord. Because if you're guilty of any of these things, you've got to make changes. You've got to repent. You've got to ask God to forgive you. You've got to go to your child, your children, and say, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this. You've, you've got to stop what you're doing. So you have to be open. And you have to have an attitude, even now as you're listening to the word preached, you have to have an attitude of, Lord, show me. Show me areas in my life and help me to be humble enough to respond in obedience. So, let me, let me give you some. This is not an exhaustive list. First of all, we all would acknowledge that rules and high standards are important. We expect as parents, we should expect that our children would obey us. It's right. It's good. But you will provoke your children to anger if you are overly strict. <clears throat> Strictness is one thing. Overly being strict, that's another. If you assert your authority with such a stern, iron-handed approach... That because you are the authority in the home, you feel you are never wrong. You can never make a mistake, and therefore you will never apologize and ask your child's forgiveness. You will have an angry, listless child. You will defeat your child. Never giving a child the opportunity to explain his behavior, to tell you his side of the story never feeling like his parents are willing to listen to him and consider what he has to say, that is frustrating. You wouldn't want anybody to do that to you, and yet we do that to children because we are the parent. We feel we know what's right. That will breed resentment and bitterness. Listen, dads and moms, you can be wrong. You are wrong at times. We all are. Just like your children, you are a sinner. And you can quote me on this next one, sinners sin. That's right, you can quote me. Sinners make mistakes. Sinners fail. And when you do make a sinful mistake in dealing with your children, humble yourself. Ask God to forgive you, admit your sin, and go to your child and ask your child to forgive you. And if you think, well, they won't respect me, you're wrong. They'll respect you far more because you're living out your faith. You're living out your faith in your home. You're admitting that what you hear every Sunday at church is true, that you are a sinner and need Christ as your Savior. If you don't admit your sin, your child is going to see you as a hypocrite. So being overly strict, overly strict, never bending, being inflexible, those are the kinds of things that will breed resentment. Secondly, you can provoke a child to anger by withholding your approval from them, by having such unrealistic standards that they can never please you. 
If you constantly tell your child all that he does is wrong, but you never or seldom tell him what he does right, you're going to break him. You're going to take the wind right out of his sails. I grew up with a, with a dad like that. No matter what I did, I felt that I could never please him. Now, I understand my dad was not a Christian, but nonetheless, that's what I faced growing up. Nothing was ever good enough for him. No grade was ever good enough. No work that I ever did was ever good enough. I, I remember thinking at times that if I told my dad that I was just elected vice president of the United States, he'd be disappointed because I was number two and not number one. That's how ridiculous it was. And because I grew up never getting my dad's approval, I struggled for years. As a Christian, I struggled with a bad attitude of anger towards him until two things changed. And I'm telling you this because I can't be the only one here who's had this experience. Two things changed that liberated me. <laughs> Number one, I chose to forgive him in my heart. My dad not being a believer, I didn't go to him and say, Dad, I want to tell you that I've forgiven you for being such a lousy guy. And my I didn't do that. That would have been counterproductive. He wouldn't have even understood what I'm talking about and would have been disrespectful to him. But I, but I chose in my heart before the Lord to forgive my dad. It was just a transaction between me and the Lord, and uh, I chose to forgive him. And folks, I tell you, it, it liberated me. It liberated me. Secondly, I recognized God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty in giving me a dad like this. It wasn't by accident. He had lessons for me. He could have given me any kind of a dad, but he gave me this dad. So why? So one reason is so that I could learn the pain of, of this and never to repeat the sin of withholding approval from my children. I don't think I would have been aware of that, at least not the depth of that, had it not happened to me. So I encourage you, if, if, you're caught, if you're a child, even if you're a grown adult and you're still caught in anger towards any of your, either of your parents or both of your parents, forgive them in your heart as Christ has forgiven you and trust the sovereignty of God. They have been chosen to be your parents because God said that's the right thing. So, Going back to parents, parents, I urge you, compliment your children. Give them loads of encouragement. I mean, you're going to have to tell them when they're wrong too, but, but praise them for attitudes and behavior that you can honestly commend them for. We're not talking about flattery. Flattery is empty. I'm talking about legitimate things you can compliment them for, you can praise them for. It's a wise decision you made. Good job. And, and never have the attitude that says something like this, I don't need to praise them for what they should be doing. They're expected to obey. Listen, that sounds more like the attitude that a master might have towards a slave, not a parent to a child. Christian children or your children need to be loved. They need to be appreciated. So give them lots of approval, lots of compliments. Just recently, I was reading about a mother who did exactly this. Instead of showing disapproval of her son, when she might have, she gave him great encouragement, showing that she believed in him. The mother I'm referring to is the mother of Benjamin West. Benjamin West was a great artist around the time of uh, the American Revolutionary War. You can look him up on, online, Benjamin West. Here's the story as I read it in a James Montgomery Boyce commentary. Here's what... Dr. Boyce said. He said, Barclay tells of the testimony of the distinguished painter Benjamin West. He was young, and one day his mother went out, leaving him in charge of his younger sister, Sally. In his sister's absence, he discovered some bottles of colored ink and decided to paint his sister's portrait. He made an awful mess. But when his mother came back, she said nothing about the terrible ink stains. Instead, she picked up the piece of paper on which he had been working and exclaimed, why, it's Sally. Then she stopped and kissed him. Benjamin West used to say, my mother's kiss made me a painter. Listen, how would you have reacted if that had been your, your child? Anger, disapproval, spanking, or wisely giving him compliments and approval? 
third way to provoke a child to anger is by favoritism, meaning that you treat one child better than another. This is what, as I said earlier, this is what Isaac did in favoring Esau over his son Jacob. And listen, we're still paying the price for that in the Israeli-Arab conflict. Sadly, Jacob, who understood the pain of this, he did the same thing in treating his son Joseph better than the other children. Not only will this breed jealousy and hatred in the children who are not treated well, as it did, by the way, in the case of Joseph's brothers. They hated him so much, they, uh, they kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. But it will also breed resentment and anger in a child towards his parents for showing such partiality. Listen, parents, you have to treat each of your children the same way, in the sense of don't show preference to one towards the other. You, you can't give one more attention than another or show more interest in one because you know what? They have certain talents you like. They have certain skills that, that you like. Maybe one son is more athletic and dad, you like that and the other son is not. That doesn't matter. You don't show preference to one over the other. John MacArthur writes this, for parents to compare their children with each other, especially in the, child, in the uh, children's presence, can be devastating to the child who is less talented or favored. He will tend to become discouraged, resentful, withdrawn, and bitter. Favoritism by parents generally leads to favoritism among the children themselves who pick up the practice from their parents. They'll favor one brother or sister over the others and will often favor one parent over the other. So, learn from that. Do not show favoritism. Don't, don't give more attention to one than you do to the other. A fourth way to provoke your children to anger is by overprotecting them. Now, it's certainly the job of parents to protect children from harm and danger. It's what we do. We're supposed to do that. But overprotection is not just protection. Overprotection is stifling. It's suffocating. It's being so fearful of anything bad happening to your child that you hinder their healthy development. You stifle a very normal part of life. What is that? It's taking risks and thinking for yourself. A child has to have some failures. That's how they learn. They have to take risks. They have to think for themselves. You can't hover over them and, and protect them because you're so fearful that they're going to get hurt. They are going to get hurt. Hear the wise words of Dr. William Hendrickson on the nature and problem of parents being overprotective. And listen, let me just say, when I say they're going to get hurt, you don't want them to get life-threateningly hurt, but you want to get them a little hurt so, so that they don't get more hurt. Here's what Hendrickson writes. He says, the fathers and mothers, too, are so fearful that harm may befall their darlings that they fence them in from every direction. He said, don't do this. Do not go here. Do not go there. Don't do this. Don't do that until this process of pampering arrives at a point where we can almost imagine them to advise their offspring, do not venture into the water until you've learned to swim. He writes, yet swim they must. To be sure, children should be warned against great dangers. On the other hand, a degree of risk-taking is necessary for their physical, moral, and spiritual development. If the little bird remains in the safety of its nest, it will never learn to fly. So parents... Let your children fly. Let them fly. Don't overprotect them. You'll ruin them. You'll end up with a child who has no confidence in doing anything because they've never been able to do anything. You, you've always been there overly protective. And they're going to have all kinds of fears which you've helped to instill in them. And they'll be angry because they weren't able to do good and normal and wholesome things that other children were allowed to do. A fifth way <coughs> to provoke a child to anger is by saying cruel words to them. It is a hideous thing, absolutely hideous, for a parent to physically abuse their child, but it is equally destructive to verbally abuse them. It is not true that words will never harm me, just sticks and stones. It's not true. 
Our authority over children doesn't give us the right to speak cruelly to them. And by cruel speech, I mean such things as name calling. You're a brat. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're a complete failure. You will never amount to anything. You say no parent would say that. Yeah, they would, and they do. You speak like this to a child, and they will not only live up to your expectations that are revealed in your words, but they will have a crushed spirit. They, they've got no defense against such language as that. You're the parental authority. You are crushing them. They, they don't know how to, how to deal with that. You're going to end up destroying them. So guard your words, guard your hearts. Now listen, I said this is not an exhaustive list, but there are many other ways that parents can provoke their children to anger. Far too many for us to explain here. I'm just going to mention a few others without commenting on them. Pressuring them to achieve. Now, we want to push our kids. I said I wasn't going to comment, just a little bit. We want to push our kids to achieve, but not beyond the normal range of encouragement to the point where you exasperate them. Getting down on them when they make childish, not sinful mistakes. Childish mistakes. Unreasonable severity in discipline or being too lenient as to not discipline. You can be so severe in your discipline and then you can be too lenient in your discipline, or you can be inconsistent in your discipline. All of that will frustrate a child. Comparing your children to others in a negative sense, I wish you could be like so-and-so. They're so successful. You know what? They're such a blessing to their parents. Neglecting your children will also provoke them to anger. You're just too busy. You got other things to do, even serving the Lord. You're, you're just busy. Not keeping your word to them. You promise them something, but your word means nothing. And the list could go on and on and on, but I think that is sufficient. Now, parents, if you find yourself guilty of any of these sins, then you need to deal with them. Not tomorrow. You need to deal with them now, tonight. Confess it. Confess it to God. It's sin. Don't make excuses. Confess. Repent. And then go and speak to your, ch your children or your child. Ask them to forgive you. Even if they're, they're now adults, it is never too late to ask their forgiveness. And if you think, oh, they won't even remember that stuff, you're wrong. They will. They'll have vivid memories of it. They've lived with this for years, so deal with it tonight. And if you don't want to keep doing stuff like this, then you know what? Go back to what Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. When you're, fill, when you're filled with the Spirit, when you're under His control, then you do what's best for your child rather than exasperate Him. And if you're an angry person, you've been exasperated by your parents, then you have to do what I said earlier. You need to forgive them in your heart. You need to accept God's sovereignty in your life. He gave you that mom and that dad for a reason. He gave you them to teach you wonderful lessons in life through them, through your parents' failures. And listen, I would say this, even if you've had a very difficult and disappointing mom and dad, you should know that God is not like them. God is not like that disappointing father to you. God is one who is a perfect father, perfect, to those who trust Christ as their savior. If you don't know him as your father, then come to Christ today, believe on him, trust him for salvation. The Lord is a wonderful, perfect wonderful father. Mm -hmm.